Today I'm here with Bart, Bart Campbell from the Melbourne Storm, who's been representing the 16 clubs to announce a new funding arrangement, a few new funding agreement with the clubs. Uh, last week, as you're all well aware, we were able to announce that the Commission has secured a $1.8 billion broadcasting agreement, the biggest in the game's history. And that agreement, when you add together with the increases in non-broadcast revenues that we're projecting through to 2022, has released an additional $200 million a year that we can invest in the game. So in very simple terms, the Commission has determined that half those funds, about $100 million, should go to the clubs. And the other $100 million should be invested in the game from the grassroots through the pathways to the elite, to the elite competitions. We've said for a long time, and it's embodied in our constitution, that the clubs need to be adequately funded. That they need to be secure, and now the game can deliver that funding and that security to them. And we're, in de we're determined also to ensure that our game thrives at every other level, and we can deliver that funding also to, that, to the grassroots and the pathways that lead to the elite competitions. This is truly a landmark agreement. And I thank Bart personally, and I thank the clubs for working so constructively towards this outcome. From here, the Commission and the clubs will sign a memorandum of understanding while the agreement is formalised. And the final package will include agreement on other non-commercial issues related to stadia, digital rights, and other items which will form the basis for each club to hold a perpetual licence to play in the NRL competition. So the great news for fans is that their clubs today are going to be stronger, they're going to be more professional, they're going to be more focused on growing their businesses, and they're going to be more financially secure as a result. And they will have an ongoing licence to forever to be part of the NRL competition. Together, the NRL and the clubs are now in a position to move forward and work together to make this game stronger at every level. Thanks once again to the clubs for this landmark agreement. Now let me pass over to Bart to make a few comments. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Um, from the club's point of view, today is truly a historic day. Um, the whole of game funding model has created alignment at every level of the game, from the players to the clubs to the NRL. It's a real opportunity for us to grow the game and to take the game forward into the future at every level of the game. One of the key tenets of this arrangement is that the clubs are now all solvent and they are able to invest in their businesses. We need to have good management, great membership people, great sponsorship people involved in the clubs. And if we've got the money to invest, which we do now, we believe that will pay real dividends for the game and will deliver benefits to our fans and members who will get a better service from the clubs. If you look at the process, I, I would say that it's worthy of two comments. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the NRL and the Commission, Tony Crawford up the back there, for the collaborative nature of the process and the transparency of the process. That has built a level of trust between the clubs and the Commission that may have not existed before. I would say the second part of the process that's worthy of noting is that the clubs have realised that whilst we compete on the field, working together off the field is a far better way forward for the game. And I hope that both of those foundations will prove valuable as we move ahead. I think the Commission has done a good job in balancing the competing interests. They certainly made the clubs aware of the need to put money uh, into grassroots. And I think on balance, we arrived at a fair outcome. And really, I guess that's, that's all I've got to say other than, again, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank Dave Smith, who started this process. And I'd like to thank the Commission. Uh, yesterday was a long day, but I'd like to point out that really the funding model was one of maybe 10 agenda items that were covered yesterday. There you go. Any questions? In the meeting yesterday, did you discuss expansion in Queensland now that these clubs have signed the agreement? No, we did not. Um, the, intent, the intent of the extra money is to drive their businesses forward and grow them, so it's about capacity building, it's capability building, and it's focusing on generating top-line revenues. But are you going to tell them how they should spend No, no, we're not going to tell the clubs how to run their businesses. Yeah. They, well, what we do have is a, sort of, is a common objective, and that's to grow the game. And that al the alignment through this is really, really significant. It's the first time, and I've watched this game for as long as many of you have watched it, 
it's the first time that we really have the, f the foundation to actually s really align. We, we've said it a lot of th times before, but now we have the foundation to do that. This is real and it's very, very important. I think I should ask Bart to answer that question. It's very significant in club land. I mean, the number you've quoted is not correct, but in the, the reality of the, the outcome is that under any metric, all clubs now are solvent. They have the wherewithal to be able to run their businesses and to run their businesses looking forward for the long term, which should mean some investment in people, investment in their facilities and services and all of those things I believe, and all the clubs believe, will help grow the game. I'm, I didn't realise we were. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'd have to say that I, <laughs> I can't read. Um, look, I think the level no, of indeed. angst uh, that has been directed towards John is possibly, not possibly, it's very overstated. We are an impatient lot. Uh, and that probably doesn't help ourselves from time to time. But with, uh, I guess, the, the process, and there's been a whole of game funding model built, which is incredibly complex, well beyond my modest um, abacus movements. And the NRL has done a huge amount of work. And, and the one thing that was missing to conclude that was actually, what is the broadcast number? Because you've got to slot that in. And once that happened, progress was made quite quickly. Um, yeah, we might have got a bit impatient and conversation definitely got robust from time to time, but I don't think at any point it was ever pointed out to John that we were seeking uh, him not to be around. We have committed, the clubs, all 16 clubs have committed in perpetuity to partner with the NRL to take the club game forward. Yeah, I think the big significant thing there is to move from term-based licences to a perpetual licence. So licences with clubs to play in the NRL competition are all geared around the five-year periods of broadcasts, and that's always been complex. And it, it provides no certainty to clubs and provides no certainty to the league. So this is all embodied, this agreement is all embodied in a perpetual licence, which is really the foundation. Oh, I think I don't. I don't know that Stonewall would be the right term. I think we've been through a process of negotiation, and you know I've said many times, and I'll continue to say it, that we're a very considered commission. And Bart referred to uh, a whole of game funding model that we've developed, which has been a very, very serious piece of work that's taken a lot of time and energy for us to understand the implications of any decisions we make. So the process has been a very engaging and absolutely robust at times conversation, which you'd expect, right? But um, the fact that the broadcast fell into place in the last week allowed us literally to pop that number into the model and all of a sudden we knew what we were dealing with. So it was very it was obvious that we could come to an agreement shortly after that. Um, was I concerned they were gunning for me? Well, I think Bart answered that question. I, I, look, I do the job as chairing the Rugby League Commission. Um, our job is to ensure the Commission makes the best decisions in the interest of the whole game and this is absolutely that... Um, so clearly defined. You know, this is a this is a decision that the commission has reached with the clubs in a very considered over a very considered process in the right amount of time at the right point that actually fundamentally aligns the clubs and the game. And it's a unique it's a unique proposition. Well, the way the, um, the the way the deal's been constructed, there'll be some uh, interim funding provided in 2016 and 2017, which will start that journey. Um, but then, when the full the full financial implication, the full financial um, benefit hits in 2018, they'll be well on that journey. But their interim funding of 1.5 million dollars each per each club per year in, in 16 and 17 will lift them all and allow them all to start that investment track that Mark just spoke about. Excuse me. I would say 2018 would be a realistic time frame to expect the clubs uh, to be um, profitable. Profitable is probably too strong because if they do go down the investment path, which is an absolute necessity for the game to go forward, uh, then you know break even is not unrealistic. And where we sit today, that is a good outcome. Mm. 
Yeah, absolutely it does. And, and what it means is that the clubs can stand on their own two feet. It means that the NRL don't have to own clubs. They don't have to prop up clubs. And uh, I think that's probably a good thing from a competition integrity point of view. I understand why they do it, and it's a necess necessity. But over time now, everyone will be able to be you know, masters of their own ship. I think that's a very important point, if I can add to that. The security of a perpetual licence and the security of a seven-year funding plan makes all of the clubs that currently are supported, for example, directly by the NRL, all become viable and all become able to go back to correct ownership outside of the, outside of the NRL. So this arrangement fuels the opportunity to have all the clubs return to their communities or to rightful owners. Uh, we're going to move ahead pretty quickly with that, as quickly as we possibly can. Again, we've sort of loosened a whole bunch of stuff that was tying that those processes up now with this arrangement, and we think we can present very, very strong arguments to people who might be interested in those clubs, whether they back in, be back in community or whether they be private ownership. Have you had private owners approach you um, expressing an interest in those clubs in recent we've, we've sort of pushed back on all engagements around that until we got this locked down. Oh, I think that's a concern for the clubs and for the game, you know, but... Uh, no, look, I think, I think we've got to understand our clubs, even if you look back over the last four years, the clubs have become more professional year on year. They understand much, much better that they've got to balance their own investment in their, own, in their football department and in their businesses. And, I, you know, this is an opportunity to really reset that. And I spoke to the CEOs this morning along these similar lines. You know, it's now up to the CEOs to take this opportunity and to make sure that they spend wisely. So, you know, that's, that's what we need to do as a game and that's what the clubs now need to do. And, and you know, they, they have got the opportunity to do that and run their businesses, which is exactly what we want them to do. We want them to be standalone, strong businesses aligned, aligned in terms of where we're all going and contributing to their own businesses and to the, and to the game as a whole. Expansion is not on our agenda at the moment. Well, I, I, you know, as Todd told you earlier, I, I think that the choice of Mal Meninga is exactly the perfect choice for the Kangaroos, and I don't think there's anyone who would actually disagree with that. You know, what we've got is one of the greatest players of all time, and the most successful coach at that sort of comp, that sort of tournament level ever. Nine series wins out of ten with the Queensland State of Origin side. He is absolutely the right person. And Todd, who ran the process, this process was run by the football department. Um, you know, I think the outcome that they've got is just fantastic. So I think we should all be really proud of the fact that we've now got a person like Mal Meninga in this national coaching role. This really redefines the kangaroo. One of the things that certainly I've been very strong on and the commission has been very strong on is restoring the status of the kangaroos to their rightful place. And part of that, of course, is to have a leader and the national coach who actually epitomises that, and that's exactly what Mal does. So I think it's a wonderful outcome. I wasn't involved in the interview process. I understand they did, yes. Sorry? No, I can't. Yeah, so we're in the process of the CEO. Um, we've got... Um, as you'd expect, we've got, it's being facilitated for us because it actually needs to be quite independent of our day-to-day -day stuff. Um, but we've got a list of people now, which is what we'd call a long list. It's really names and people who've demonstrated or, or, or shown interest. And there's been, you know, gratifyingly, there's been a huge amount of interest shown. And it's quite interesting reflecting, as Bart and I were a moment ago, on, on the, having signed off the, the um, broadcast deal and now having signed off this agreement with the clubs are in the process of doing that. Um, the next CEO comes into this job as a, in a very attractive position. So just want to hold back a bit on that to make sure that we clear the air and allow, allow the candidates to step forward. So we've got a long list and we're about to reach out to the people we've identified who we think could be interested. We'll pull that in together. By Christmas, we'll have a workable short list and then we'll go into the process of interview subsequent to that. pretty hard, the season starts into Jan, you know, pretty hard to see us putting, having someone in place by then. John, you've mentioned the people clubs, but the players, the RLPA, have concerns over scheduling and 
Yeah. Well, you know, Todd dealt with, and I was involved in conversations with um, both Clint Newton and with Ian Prendergast um, in the last couple of days, and we've got ongoing discussions going there, but Todd's handling that relationship. So in terms of the five-day turnarounds, you know, as I said when we announced the broadcast deal, um, in 2016, we've got a transition, and I don't need to repeat the rest of it, but we've got a no worse situation, and in 2017, we'll have a much better situation. And, and I, you know, I, my, my conversations with um, the RPA reps, um, they understand that because they understand the realities of, of the broadcast. Um, in, terms of, um, in terms of going forward with the RPA, well, we've got a CBA to negotiate, and, you know, I anticipate those discussions will start in, you know, sort of early next year, and they'll continue throughout next year, and we'll get to an agreement that's the right agreement for the players and players within their clubs and for the players in, within the game. Yeah, we are. And again, I'm not involved in the detail, uh, but Todd is driving that. But what we said was we should absolutely look at the end of next, at the end of the season, um, when we go back to four games on free to air, um, and we, sh I'm sorry, at the end of this, this next season, when we go to the rounds that have not yet been committed, and we should figure out what we can do differently. As well as that, we should look at all of the components of what players actually go through in order to get to a game. You know, can we, what can we do about travel? What can we do about accommodation? What sort of things that can we do that? <coughs> will make it you know, as good an experience as it can be, knowing full well that you know, players, clubs have got commitments to play in the competition and players play for their clubs. Yeah, look, I think the reality is there are challenges for the next year. I think there's an ability to improve things for the 2017 season. Uh, Monday night games are going away in 2017. Mm. And then if you look forward from the new broadcast deal starting 2018, uh, I think five-day turnarounds are completely gone from the game. So it's an issue that's been addressed as best as it can be within the context of existing contracts. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, I've got a coach who's not too pleased about five-day turnarounds and, um, you know, they harm the players. They're, they're, they're not good for competition integrity and, and pleasingly they are going away. So... I think they've done a good job in reclaiming the draw, the NRL, and I think the broadcast agreement uh, needs to be looked at beyond just the cash that's been generated, which is great, but some of the, the mechanisms and mechanics that have been built into the new broadcast deal are really good, A, for fans, and B, for players. Mm. Yeah, the, the research we've done shows that it takes a minimum of five days for recovery. So you've got, to, you've got to go beyond five days, yeah. So it's, it's I mean, it's, as Bart just said, you know, when we get into 2018, when we've actually got control over the draw, um, and given that, you know, the, we're able to satisfy the broadcasters that, in fact, our competition can and will remain extremely competitive, which is what their concern has always been about having picks, um, when we get into 2018, you know, we'll have clear air to actually decide, make all those decisions. And, you know, I don't think we can commit to the fact that there'll be no five-day turnarounds, but, but what our intent is absolutely to make sure that we minimise that, we, sorry, we give the players the appropriate time to recover. Well, the NRL might spend it. Look, we've obviously spent a lot more time dealing with the commission of late. There's some very smart people around the table. Um, just as we hope that we can be treated as big boys, we need to treat them, and girls, we need to treat them the same way and let them get on about their business. I think the focus for both sides is really about what's the right allocation. Thereafter, if you're um, inappropriate in club land with your own funds, you know, um, I think you, know, you should feel some pain for that. We need to let them get on and do their job, and um, the way it's structured, that's exactly what they'll do. Sorry, say again. Richo's manifesto. Oh, Richo's manifesto. When will we get to Shane? Shane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're in the consultation. We're back, we're back into sort of the final consultation phase. Um, but, you know, Richo's manifesto, <laughs> as you refer to it, um, it's really exciting, you know, it's, and it's an exciting opportunity um, for the game at what I regard as one of the elite levels, which is the State Cups, and the, the power that the State Cups can give back to the community of rugby league by local identification of their team. You know, I think it's, it's just, it's, it really is an opportunity, again, to, 
further the connection of this game at an elite level with the community that supports it. So um, we'll wait and see. We'll, we'll, we'll be telling you, because we think it's good news, we'll be telling you as soon as we think it's appropriate. Well, and the states, yes. It's been a hugely cons consultative process that Shane's been been taking everyone through. But we've obviously got our own point of view on this. So you know, we've been we've been contributing very strongly to what we think is right because, you know, we all, we do have, and the commission has always had an independent view of things, and that's the sick, that's the real opportunity this game <coughs> has to still take advantage of that. You can get independent thinking into things which would understandably be less than independent. So, you know, the states have got very strong views about how competition should run, and that's great. The Country Rugby League has a similar view. Um, what we're able to do is to try and bring all those views together and articulate something that's good for everyone. That's, this, that's exactly what we've been through with the clubs. It's exactly what we went through with the broadcasters, and we expect to go through that with the states. I've had adequate. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be here.